Right, so I have notes. Um, for those of you who know me, I, and for those who don't, I am Akshat. I started a firm called Architecture Discipline in 2007. And we've done a few things, and some of those, I guess, have resulted in me being here, uh, talking to all of you, and uh, hopefully, by the end of it, engaging in some kind of uh, discourse. Um, I was, uh, at, this is a chat, and I'm actually just sort of speaking extemporary of a couple of notes that are in front of me, and they're just really bullet points. And it's something that sort of had us thinking or talking amongst each other for a while, uh, which is how do we shape the future of our cities? Uh, can we do something now? And by now, I don't just, I don't want to overemphasize on what's happening, what our current, you know, COVID-19 based situation is. I just mean uh, how we've made our planet fairly uninhabitable of the last 20, 25 years. Um, and to me, this the, the, the discourse starts with how, as I remember it, architects used to be technocrats and they weren't all only uh, solving a client's problem or serving a client. Architects were creating narratives, creating visions for a future. Uh, there was a post it, it was a preempted future with some sort of utopian vision uh, and I mean, we've all seen renders by or sketches by Frank Lloyd Wright, by Le Corbusier um, and Buckminster Fuller and we've seen elaborate projects that were sort of put out there and that's because we, the profession wasn't purely an, uh, an economic engagement. The last 20 odd years or two and a half decades have been largely, the development of the world has largely been driven by economic concerns in their entirety. And I feel it's about time that we start, we go back to our roots a bit, just sort of revisit. I think a lot of good things have come out of the last two and a half decades. I can't say not. I think we've really, really refined. Uh, some levels of some levels of uh, you know our skill sets our, our ability to our ability to do certain things to communicate to sort of put some things together and uh, uh, sorry and um, so to be able to put certain to to be able to communicate certain ideas to a paying client um, and I think also to be able to communicate within the fraternity as such uh, I, but I think a couple of a couple of poor things have come out of it uh, such, so much so that we've lost the ability to criticize each other we we only want to talk to people who want to hear what we're saying we only want to talk to talk to people who are in agreement with us we are we're, we're almost afraid of uh, critical dialogue we're, we're, we're afraid of uh, we're afraid of criticism, we're afraid of sort of bearing ourselves out, uh, we're afraid of talking to people who might be smarter than us often, or, or we're afraid of talking to people who we consider are not as smart as us. Um, and that's resulted in us sort of taking a profession which has, which has very, very deep roots, which, has, which, which, is a, which is a very old profession, it goes back, you know, it's probably one of the oldest professions in the world, and uh, and we sort of thinned it out to become a mere service uh, more than anything else. So we uh, and I and I think and that's how I that's what I also said. I think I think we need to we need to stop rendering a service at some level, and we need to change the process so that our contribution is a little more relevant, a little more positive, or a lot more positive. And we go back to what architecture was meant for. It was meant to make your life feel better, it was meant to move you, in move your spirit and I, and I don't mean that in a, in a deeply spiritual way, also might be true for some, but I don't mean it in, in, a, in a religious spiritual way and it's supposed to give you certain things that are immeasurable right? and uh, 
and and create um, and create a built environment that is sort of intellectually charged and engaging and and and, and positive. Um, and that that takes us into two paradigms or two two different sort of uh, directions. So that's how that's what we see at architecture discipline. There's one which is the you know the what what we believe is is the new architect sort of moving forward, making progressive buildings with complex programs um, and sort of what you would typically call a greenfield project. But we've also recently discovered that uh, preservation can be a path forward for us, and we've uh, we found domains of architecture that are beyond just you know simple multiplication of you know all kind of a kind of trouble stamp multiplication of of things or going down like an egotistical architect sort of breaking what existed and sort of rebuilding from scratch. We've started engaging in projects that are uh, adaptive reuse, addressing ruins, addressing things that did exist in the past that were maybe remnants of a culture of a remnant of a you know well, for at the highest level the remnant of a civilization um, to to sort of find the pleasure within that to create a new understanding of uh, of well of modern age uh, living and um, because at the end of the day there's, there, you know someone spent a lot of time building creating a you know a physical environment and that it survived a couple of decades or a few centuries um, is telling on what what actually has been done and there is a poetic uh, there is a poetic angle to it, and there is there is also a pragmatic side to it. How much more can we really consume? How much more? How much more mining do we need to do? How much more oil do we need to consume? How much natural? Eventually, whatever resources processed and build, uh, brought out to us as a uh, as part of the construction industry or the building industry is uh, consumption driven. So, can architects today champion? A new economic paradigm. Can we actually start thinking about uh, about what we're doing as a resource-based system or a knowledge-based system, as opposed to a uh, you know a uh, an economically driven paradigm? Can we start creating things that have deeper meaning? Can we start creating things that uh, can we start looking at the past specifically uh, to start um, to reinterpret it, to recreate objects, so that we can, so that we can actually, well, find a new dynamic idea for sustainability that engages with the past, as opposed to just, uh, as opposed to just engaging in, in, in a sort of meaningful, uh, in a meaningless uh, act of self-indulgence. Sorry, I'm getting a few notes here. I just would like to see them. Okay, guys, that's distracting. Sorry, you know who I, you know who you are, and don't do it. Um, so, um, I think what I, th I think the way we need to start seeing things is. Uh, how we need to start looking at development now for the future is that it's a while while there will always be a need for inspiring tools inspiring technique there is something that there is a sort of plateau that uh, current technology has brought us to and it's it's brought us to a point where our our interpersonal communications kind of decaying right and um, I'm going to try and share an image if I can with you guys. Um, I'm doing this for the first time, so please excuse errors. And Apple's letting me down by not updating things fast enough. But if you can see that, um, now I need help. Can someone say yes? Ah, great. Thank you. 
Um, so that's our typical engagement at a dinner table. And I feel that, I think architects are not reacting to that fast enough. Uh, I think it's about time we do. Um, and maybe that's the way I think that's the way we as human beings, we have, we, well, I think all of us human beings have to now become conscious to how we're actually engaging. Are we more in our mobile phones than anything else? Or are we more engaging with technology more than anything else? And technology in a way where it's sort of bringing you back into your shell as opposed to sort of reaching out to the world, because it's not that. And when I talk about engaging, you know, when I used to talk about engaging with architecture and technology, it used to be that. So that's uh, the Tijibao Cultural Center by Renzo Piano. And uh, that's how that's how we would talk about it. Um, now, as as uh, as architects, I think it's important for us to 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 understand how how we are making the planet sort of unidimensional and uh, non-engaging. Uh, and can we at least go back, start looking at how we really want to engage with sustainability? and sustainable development, can we add a dimension of preservation to it and um, can we start looking at projects or, or beautiful old settings and sort of start creating them in uh, or, or setting them out in a, in, a, in a new paradigm per se for a new world. Um, this image is from Calcutta and it's a project that we did uh, a couple of years ago where we Sort of, we started a project a few years ago to sort of to 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 show a what was a five star hotel in a new light. I mean, and and we take five star hotels because sometimes those are projects that allow us uh, that allow us uh, the time and uh, the space for experimentation to actually project something, to resolve it, to, to to bring it out of the world and test it at the highest levels, so that you can then sort of. You can you can take that essence and then pass it on to others, uh, but uh, that's just a that's just sort of a, a method statement or a technique per se. But eventually we did realize that what's happening, no matter what we do, no matter how nice a building we create, our cities end up looking like this, and that's because for some reason when we're in architecture school, you believe that the idea of architecture is like typical is a glorified, ghettoized idea of of architecture and um, anything else that you will do will actually just be uh, is, 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 is a sort of uh, egotistical engagement but I think we need to wake up because what's happening now is it's sort of this sort of ignorance from the side of architectural academics and the, and the lack of engagement in meaningful In meaningful context, and I I don't mean context just in the, in in terms of uh, art and tradition and, and material. I mean context as in a physical built environment will probably result in something like this, right? That's a very dystopian vision. We take we take a green field with with nature and and it in all its glory. We sort of start building a little, then we start building a little more. Eventually, we say we've run out of natural resource, and finally we're taken over by nature because there is no way to preserve it or, or sort of or sort of continue with it. Um, and, and I think that um, that it's important that we now start, we look at preservation, we look at, because it's a lot easier to do. You're not consuming resource as much as you would otherwise. Um, this is what I'm showing you on the screen now is an example of a project that we engaged in a few years ago, it's in Jodhpur. And we found, we did a little study, we found a small part of an old city, we realized it doesn't cost us too much money or it doesn't take too much effort. I mean, it takes a little bit of intellectual effort, but not so much physical effort, a lot less compared to actually building new, sort of sandblasted it out and created a, a nice, uh, and recreated a, or re-energized an old bauli or an old step well, which, uh, which sort of which resulted in the creation of a couple of other um, you know, sort of cafeterias or you know spaces um, you know sort of commercial establishments that would then that would then 
tell people the narrative of the old city and also also allowed occupation a meaningful occupation for other occupants of the city uh, what that actually meant was taking buildings that have decayed over the years you know have, have been abused um, through the past generational changes um, uh by divided families so on and so forth and with a little bit of effort you could actually just um, and that effort is a intellectual effort and be financial effort you could actually just clear it up and sort of make something a lot nicer a little more pristine um led us to you know uh, of course we were we were faced with the regular cynicism that while well, you can do that in an old city and it's easier can you really do that in a in contemporary space and we sort of demonstrated that by partnering with uh, the common room uh, that's it that's in dhanil so it's an old uh, it was an old uh, greenery complex in uh, in south delhi and it's actually right opposite a uh, crematorium and we could we took a few buildings there which were a few shared industrial shared and converted them for space for new enterprise so that's this is now not just a demonstration of how you could do it as a physical space but also how you program it to actually give back so this is a place for new enterprise for anyone who needs mentorship anyone who needs to learn a little bit or or, or needs a little guidance as as sort of an idea but says i don't know how to take this idea forward can someone help me out so it's it's there for that it's there for discourse it's there for people to bring out new uh, to start talking about new ideas and new uh, new directions uh, that that they may have been engaging it so it's not formal research it's not a formal institution but it is something else uh, another example of that was what we did with uh, koyo where we actually said you know you you're a great uh, they they're a great uh, platform but they they didn't really have a product and we said can we take the platform to actually start cleaning out the city so it was a city takeover or a clean out through subterfuge where we gave them a catalog and we said well next time you have an opportunity why don't you sort of clean up a building and uh, well plug in a little bit of um, you know sort of IT into it but more of more importantly sort of find inexpensive ways to clean it up so that you're actually giving back to the pavement uh, because there's a lot of engagement that really happens i mean that's our visual clue when we walk into a city right it's the it's the space between the street and the, the space between the street and the building and the pavement and that's actually where our experience of a city really happens so what we could do through this was demonstrate how you can take old what we think are not usable buildings any more typical 3 4 5 hundred square yard plots that people bring break down and sort of make new brand new homes that they break down again after 10 years and then come to architects like us and say you know i i made a house 10 years ago and i it's not livable anymore or i could how how do it um i my parents house is i think 50 years old and i still don't think about don't it i still and it's not like it's been the same you you upgrade it and so there are incremental upgrades and there are slightly larger upgrades but how can we sort of engage in that um when can we see it can we see it differently can we see it almost like a revolutionary idea can we as a profession take over everything can we come together almost like a burning man like society and that's an image from from there where you sort of set up very clear rules for ourselves given today's time day age today's need for communication today's need for us to turn things around faster than we've ever imagined and i think i think that's really lacking i think the one of the biggest problems in architecture is that our contributions take too long the realization of our contributions take too long can we come together or start a movement in our in our uh in our fraternity to actually start a very very radical transformation of our of our built environment through what actually exists uh, can we be nimble enough can we be as nimble as the it industry or can we be as nimble as as uh, can we be as nimble as uh, as the advertising industry i mean after all someone i mean the burning man demonstrates it every year and if they can if they can set it up for it to be safe habitable within a few months every year and sort of create absolutely extreme uh cutting edge built environments for a, for a short while can we actually do something with it um and it's uh, 
through whatever we have. I mean, in our studio now, we're, we're doing exercises on Rhino and Grasshopper and whatnot, and you're programming stuff. So if you can program, if you can look at programming new skins and new buildings, can we sort of stop investing our energy in veneering over elevations as if, or, or, or build fabrics and buildings as if they were just, they were textile and nothing more than that. And can we actually uh, look at context beyond just what is immediate past? Can we can we look at built environment as serious legacy and uh, and address it in a more uh, meaningful manner? Because we're now in a decaying society, and we have to reflect on that decay. We have to see how architecture can become a a sort of technocratic art again, which can show us a way forward. Can we move away from our ghettos and become a more organized uh, fraternity so that we can uh, we can stop being a polluting industry anymore? Can we start looking at uh, preserving what we have in a more meaningful way to give us a path forward? Okay, I'm going to end this. And, uh, I will open out comments now. Okay, guys, I've sort of I'm open to comments. I'm oops, sorry. I'm uh, open to comments. I'm sort of. Done with this. I have a few questions. It's a pity that I can't hear anyone talk. There should be a way to do that. Um, So, Harini Kumar has asked me a question. She said, how can a young architect put themselves out there? Do you think starting a YouTube channel will help? Um, okay, uh, I'm not the right person to ask, answer that question. I don't believe social media is the way to really put yourself out there. Um, I think we need to, uh, I, think, I think the first thing a young person has to do is find themselves a um, a mentor of some sort, a place where you can engage yourself long enough for years, for a few years, a studio that sort of that you feel is uh, that can that can sort of give your architectural spirit some direction. And I think it's only after you have something meaningful to say, and that's been tested and reviewed by serious enough people that that you need to find a medium to sort of start communicating it. Um, Sethya asked me what are sustainable materials in interiors and how can we use them in our projects? Well, sustainability is a dynamic concept. Um, so I think uh, there, are, there are various levels of engage, studies that you can do on it and research that you can do on it. Can you have stuff that is, can you take things that are more recyclable, have longer lifespan? Can you start with first planning something so that fundamentally you're dealing with a good quality of light, enough fresh air and a clean space so that it can lend itself to a multiplicity of use? Um, that's something that we've forgotten, it seems. Or that's what I, I see missing in most spaces that I see around me. They're too specific. Um, how do you believe AI would change the way we design? Um, I think AI is already contributing a lot to the way we design because it's, it's a lot of it is conditioning our mind, let's not forget that. I mean, how can Google predict what you're going to search for by the time you reach out for uh, your laptop or your, or your tablet or, your, or, or, your, or the search engine on your phone to look for something? How 
is it that uh, it can predict traffic movements and the route you should take. So I think we need to start looking at planning as your genesis of design. And when you start looking at it in that manner, you will see where uh, that AI is sort of already dictating it. And of course, when you start looking at parametric programming, uh, not just parametric expression or parametricism as expression, you might find that uh, it it does give you it it gives you very quickly clues as to how you can sort of uh, how you can how you can engage. Materials of the future. Um, I think materials of the future are into a large part materials of the past, uh, but the uh, but I think the biggest material of the future is your is your knowledge base. I mean the resource of your knowledge base. So can you start sort of combining? Uh, can we start using things like carbon fiber and uh, and sort of higher performance uh, and 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 well, glue laminated timber and such? Of course we can. I think. You, I, I think the, the approach to finding a new material is really an approach that sort of gets you something. It's not, it's not the fetishizing of the material itself that, that leads you somewhere. Architectural philosophy, top three thinkers. Um, Well, Buckminster Fuller for one, uh, I think uh, Ron Heron for another, and uh, Christopher Alexander for the third, yeah. You said we will design a building, but the cities remain the same. What are your suggestions about architectural fraternity coming together uh, to change the built environment? I think um, I think the first is to be open to critique and dialogue. I think that's missing. Um, the right kind of engagement at the academic level. I think a lot of academic institutions are not really engaging practicing professionals and practicing professionals who are. Uh, I, I mean, it's, and I don't just mean one special lecture. I mean, I mean a proper deep kind of engagement. I think the need for someone to, for for academic institutions or places of learning to actually push forward the idea of of, uh, of actually working in a studio as opposed to just getting employed in a studio, sort of contributing to one long enough. Uh, for years enough, almost like a, a sort of, uh, with the idea of, of, of a meaningful mentorship of having practices that are equal opportunity uh, firms at that level and then of course at a larger level as a com community sort of, like I said, dialogue, criticism, being open to, to talking to people who don't necessarily agree with you, who don't necessarily see things the way you would want them to be seen. How do you propose a way to slow down technology or use it to increase interpersonal engagement? I think, look, te technology, we, we don't get to vote on whether it changes our lives or not. It, it is here to stay and it will. And, and I think it's, and everything is technology, right? I mean, even the burnt clay brick was technology at one point in time. It was the highest level of tech a few thousand years ago. So why are we so averse to it? I think what we're doing is trying to slow ourselves down. Uh, we need to really start playing catch up as a fraternity. I think from the moment we start conceiving an idea to communicating it, and that communication, once that is overhauled, that first within our own selves and as, as individuals, and then within the fraternity, and then engaging outside of fraternity, we might end up creating new meaning for ourselves. At the moment, by by constantly criticizing it or trying to ignore its presence in our 
in our milieu are saying it's the it's it's in it's in it's it's a it's an inappropriate imposition. It's it's wrong. I mean, I can engage with a few hundred people who I've never met in my life, and they can write out to me because of that very technology, right? So, what if? technology allows us for the communication overall, then how is it that we're not able to adapt that communication overall in our own professional practice? Uh, architecture in a city like Delhi, where the build forms are non-interactive and self-centered, um, what kind of architecture would imply otherwise? Do you what is that an architect could do? I think we need to start designing the spaces outside the buildings. I think the, the space between between buildings is as important as the space within buildings. I think that's something that we've we've ignored. Um, and we just created sort of picket fences or boundary walls, like solid boundary walls along uh, uh, around ourselves, and that isn't a, a a sort of engaging paradigm, right? You can't really go and make walls around yourself. And let's let's not forget, large parts of cities, the the, the majority of cities, is actually place for just habitat and not not uh, work engagement. Why do you think ancient buildings last longer than what we have today? Is it more sustainable than what we pursue in today's architecture? Uh, no, like I said, I think I, I, I will maintain that sustainability is a dynamic concept. What might be sustainable living is simply about, uh, is, is simply development, or sustainable development is development that will meet our needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. And that's a dynamic idea. It's not about building a certain way, but, and I think that's, it has a lot to do with our patterns of consumption. So if you have something old, you have something that you can preserve, you'll all, and you'll find it. You just have to find the ability in yourself to look at for the good in things. Just the way you have to find the ability in yourself to look at the good in people. And once you do, you'll see, uh, that you can, you can, you can, you can take an old what would otherwise feel, seem dilapidated or non-recoverable uh, built resource and sort of convert it into something that's 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 usable. And like I said, I think our uh, our project at the Grand Calcutta, the the JDH project at Jodhpur and the Dhan Mill project are three different examples of it. And I think the, the easiest way to engage in it for a young architect is to engage it in people's homes. Um, so when someone comes into you and says, "I want to bring this, this, you know, this is an old 30-year-old building or a 15-year-old building, and it's made distastefully, I would like to bring it down." I think the first thing you should do is see what you can preserve there, because even in what may seem nondescript and not special, there is something to preserve, and we need to be stop being biased about what we believe is special. I have two more questions. Is there always a need to take to have a concept to design anything? Well, um, I think for lack of a better. I mean, I think concepts are much abused word. You do, definitely do need to have. You sh it's better if you have a narrative, uh, and the narrative is not a literal storytelling narrative. It, it's really better if you have something that you can sort of engage with, in a, uh, you know, to, to sort of to hold a, to, to be able to fit, that helps you filter out ideas and sort of take the ones that are most that are stronger and that will actually contribute to. As opposed to having ones that are that are that are just mm, that, 
then, then I'll just sort of click here and tell it what, what you may say are design gimmicks. And I think you need to not have biases on what you believe is special. I think everything will have, has, has, anything that's been created can be preserved. There's very little which is absolutely awful that needs to go. So that, and that I think a conceptual framework also helps you do. And you know, cities and densities play a huge and huge role in the current scenario. And the architecture discipline has some idea on how to deal with. It. Actually, I I don't think I have an idea. Or I don't think the studios really. Uh, I think I think the studios really just absorbing it right now to see what's happening. It's a one in hundred year occurrence. So do we need to? Do we need to react to it today? Um, maybe not. I think I think we need to. I think we need to absorb the length and breadth of what really is happening at the moment to be able to uh, before we before we determine our reaction to it. Sakshi Saxena says, "Why are all your clients upper class?" I, I have no idea. Paul, my I don't. I don't. We don't. We don't select client per class. I, I think, and I think there are that's, but it's an interesting question because I think there are there is. We need to understand what we are doing with architects, right? So while uh, you may engage with a certain, you may engage with with architecture for for ninety nine percent of the population through larger scale work such as master planning and housing and whatnot. There, um, when you do individual homes or you do you do smaller level developments, you have to engage with people who are sort of engaging you, and that's one uh, financially, and that's that's one of the points I made earlier. That I think the last 25 years, and it's not just in India; it's across the world. The last 25 years of of development have been dictated by uh, have been, have been dictated by uh, by by economic paradigm, it's not been dictated by by a sort of um, an understanding of um, of value systems or what we really need to do to create built environment beyond just money or who's spending more money. Okay, so I think I've gone on for 45 minutes and I should, okay Niji, I hope you can hear me, but it's about, that's about all I have time for and um, you can write in more questions I, I'm sure and we'll find a way to answer them. Okay, thank you guys, thank you for being here, bye.